the, the paper um, is a production of Albert Richel, immediately uh, to my right, uh, who is a uh, professor in the Department of Economic History, uh, perhaps the last standing Department of Economic History in the United Kingdom at the London School of Economics, as you'll see from the slide. Um, he, his previous appointment was at the Humboldt University in Berlin, He's taught at various places in Europe. Um, before then, I'll uh, leave him to speak for himself uh, in a moment. Uh, the discussants will be Volker Berkant, uh, immediately to Albrecht Wright, uh, who is the Seth Lowe Professor of History uh, at Columbia University in New York. A great institution. Um, and to his right, uh, Brad DeLong, um, a colleague of mine for most of my professional life, um, now uh, Professor of Economics uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and a former Treasury official for the Clinton administration. So Albrecht will um, not expound, but um, speak briefly um, about the paper uh, for seven minutes, plus or minus. The discussants will each speak for 10 to 15 minutes each. Um, and at that stage, the floor will be open for discussion, general discussion until 4 o'clock. OK, thank you all very much for coming. So thanks very much. Thank you for inviting me. It is uh, immensely, uh, it's an immense pleasure to be back at Penn. Uh, nice indeed, and it's a great honor to uh, uh, be allowed to speak in this seminar. Um, uh, as you just heard, I'm not going to present my paper. Uh, instead, I'm going to uh, uh, try and motivate and defend why uh, it occurred to me to write this paper. And after that, there will be a true Frankenstein of uh, commentary. <laughs> and, um, uh, and that's going to be the exciting part. Uh, so um, what is uh, this research about? Let me see if I get this uh, remote to run. Um, no, no, of course not. Um, um, uh, could we have to first uh, click this? This is wonderful. Um, uh, just motivating the research. Um, uh, this is part of a wider research project, and it's actually a very European research project. The idea, basically, to write um, what could be kind of central and focal and maybe almost neglected parts uh, of the economic and financial history of the 20th century from a distinctly non-American perspective, but still uh, I'm afraid to say an uh, important perspective, and that is what is happening at the intersection between political conflict and financial and, and debt history uh, in Europe in the 20th century. That has a lot to do, uh, unsurprisingly, with, uh, uh, with Germany. Um, I've been writing about these things uh, uh, for many years. I have um, uh, some research on uh, German reparations in the interwar period from like incentive-based um, um, uh, interpretation, uh, stuff that hasn't made me terribly popular in Germany uh, because uh, it doesn't make us uh, look very good. But anyway, it has to be written. It's important to do this kind of stuff. This project is uh, very much unfinished, and um, that's one of the reasons why I bring it here, so to speak, outside of its European context, where every, for, for everybody it's a repeated game, and everybody knows the questions or has known the questions and answers to all these things uh, for a thousand years. Um, so uh, the really interesting from me, the thing for me here is to come here, speak to you about it, and listen to your comments um, uh, on it in order to see uh, what is actually uh, uh, the, uh, what are the perspectives that, uh, that smart people outside of this kind of cauldron of, um, uh, of political conflict have. Um, and um, it is essentially this, this kind of political and historical context. Um, uh, that is uh, uh, that is interesting, and in a way, what we are seeing right now is uh, another incarnation of these uh, uh, European financial crises in its current form as a southern European debt crisis, uh, which uh, I think has kind of long-term connections to uh, uh, to a previous debt problem, which is going to be the focus today. And that's Germany's debt problem after after World War II, which itself was not an exogenous event, but had its own connections to a German debt problem after World War I, which was itself not an exogenous event, but had a connection to a French debt problem after 1871, which was in itself not an exogenous event, but had its um, uh, connection to a, uh, a European slash French uh, debt problem uh, around and after 1815. That's the usual European thing that gets pretty boring if you do it uh, for more than three iterations. And of course, <laughs> there is some, and of course there is historical <laughs> subtext 
and um, let me just briefly bring this to you, basically as the um, as um, I'm not in a position to give the talk, which is good. Could we probably have the next slide? Sorry, I have a difficulty with this remote. Um, so um, uh, let's let's start from the end of the paper with the eurozone debt crisis. And the questions that have been asked is: um, uh, Do we need a Marshall Plan for Southern Europe? You've certainly noticed that whenever there is a problem uh, in whatever of the four corners of the road, somebody is popping up and says, I have the solution, we need a Marshall Plan. And um, would it be desirable? Yes, of course it would be desirable, provided um, we, uh, uh, we know that no other options exist um, and we actually know what the Marshall Plan means and uh, whether there are historical parallels to that. It turns out to be a bit of a non-trivial question. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I'm basically standing on the shoulders of uh, political and diplomatic historians who did most of that work already in the, in the 1970s and 1980s. And um, I'm, I'm belonging to, or I'm part, so to speak, of a, of a strand of research that is uh, uh, trying to provide the economics for that. I did exactly the same trick in my research on the interval period. I was basically, uh, basically mm, starting out <coughs> from political and diplomatic history and then was trying to provide the incentive theory to that. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Um, yeah, what was the Ma Ma Marshall Plan actually? Um, how and why did it work? This is, of course, something that has been discussed over and over, and uh, many different aspects uh, have, been, uh, have been highlighted. What I'm uh, doing in this paper is on also only one aspect. This is not the ultimate and, um, uh, and ex kind of exclusionary, all encompassing interpretation of the Marshall Plan. Of course not. Uh, instead, it's about one thing. It's about what I think is kind of the hardest problem they had to deal with uh, in, 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 in making the Marshall Plan work and in, in designing it. And this is basically how to deal, uh, how to deal with uh, uh, with Germany or what was left of Germany uh, uh, after World War II. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm extremely sorry. This is um, a bit anti what I what I didn't do here. Um, foreign interventions. Don't click now because then the slide is, disappears. Um, foreign interventions, uh, uh, just to kind of bring us up to speed, have their limits. And one of the re the reason is that the recipient country is suffering. That is what uh, uh, often happens. Um, and um, uh, the, so the recipient might do things with the, with the money or the resource transfers that were not exactly what you intended to do. Um, uh, the same thing with debtor countries. Um, why is this? It is, of course, that debtor countries are notoriously populated by bad people. No, that's not the reason. The reason is that, uh, that especially if debtor countries have governments that are, uh, that are not dictatorships, but in some way, it doesn't have to be democracy, but in some way, responsive uh, to the political will of their, of their population, then essentially governments of debtor countries become the servants of two masters. Hmm? One is uh, one constituency, one set of stakeholders is the domestic electorate, and one set of stakeholders are the foreign creditors. We are in such a situation again, and that essentially gives, uh, leads to limits to what foreign pressure uh, applied to, and now you put in star points, star the country that you uh, uh, the country, the study or country case that you prefer, Argentina, uh, uh, Greece, uh, uh, um, um, Mexico, whatever. Um, typically, foreign restructuring programs have their limits in the sovereignty of these countries. Uh, why is that? Because uncooperative behavior of the debtor country is a serious and, and, and um, credible threat. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so there are several layers of historical context in the paper. Uh, one is lack of German sovereignty post-1945. This is a point I really want to drive home today um, because that kind of limits any of these superficial conclusions that we, uh, uh, that we draw about Marshall plans and their applicability uh, to southern Europe these days. Um, uh, uh, Greece is still a sovereign country and the others are too. Um, so that is, as I said, limiting things. Um, next layer of uh, historical context is German non-cooperation with another peace arrangement um, uh, post-1918, uh, where sovereignty was still there. It, it attempts to limit it, but um, uh, enforcement mechanisms were notoriously limited. That could be a whole evening. We don't do this, just to have it in mind. Because this experience of German non-cooperation after 1918 uh, is what put Marshall planners on a learning curve, or the um, the, the, the beginnings of planning for the post-war period. They put them on a learning curve in the Marshall Plan. In its actual incarnation, what we then see is, so to speak, the uh, end result of that. Um, just to, can we, do have, can we have the next one? 
Excellent. Just to give you a little bit uh, of this context, here you see, here you see three uh, uh, well-known figures uh, sitting at a conspicuous place. This is in the garden uh, of the Sanssouci Castle of the Prussian King Frederick the Great in 1945, uh, designing or trying to design Germany's post-war future. The, the imagery should be clear. These are the three big guys. Um, they essentially have to say this is, they are calling the <coughs> a very, very strong symbol uh, um, that everybody at the time clearly understood. The show of German nationalism is over. These guys are calling the shots now. Can we do the next one? Now this, of course, has its uh, historical precedence. Here you see uh, a similar scene. This is 1871, uh, the proclamation of the German Empire in the, uh, in the castle of Versailles. Now everybody who knows the places will immediately admit that Versailles is slightly, slightly bigger than Sans Souci. Uh, that does not have to do with the lack of ambition of the Prussian kings, but really the lack of money. Uh, the, um, uh, the position that these two castles have in, this is, in, the, in, the, in the program of national self-representation uh, is, is actually quite comparable. So here you see that, uh, again, Potsdam 1945, this photo shot was not an exogenous event. It had its precursor, and the precursor is that painting, hmm, which uh, showed to everybody in 1871 quite clearly that um, France's role as, um, uh, as Europe's dominant superpower, which it had had almost without dispute for, you name it, 800 years or something like that, had basically reached its end. This is actually more stronger, though this is stronger, this, this, this imagery in a way, than, uh, than Napoleon's defeat of, of 1850. L let's go to the next one, and I'm almost done. This is again an image from Versailles, uh, uh, trying to drive a home a point. This is the signing of the Peace Treaty of 1919. So um, there are some small heads uh, almost invisible on this photo. That's the German delegation signing the Peace Treaty of Versailles. The important thing about this picture is the location. This is not Potsdam. It is not in Potsdam. Mm -hmm. The proper counterfactual would have been, proper counterfactual to, to Versailles 1871, would have been Potsdam 1919, victorious Allied troops, French troops, proclaiming a new French monarchy uh, in the Council of uh, Sanssouci. Um, one could think about what the consequences for German history would have been had the, uh, had the Allies actually uh, 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 invaded Germany and fully occupied the place in 1990. Next slide, please. Um, and that's basically then for, uh, for the discussion so that everybody is um, uh, informed about uh, what we're talking about. This is a timeline of the Marshall Plan uh, that I'm not presenting.